Massimo, uh, a real pleasure to, to have you here. Uh, actually, I was just explaining that there's an interpretation button at the, you know, the bottom to the right corner in the screen so that, you know, participants can follow you in English, which is the language you're going to do for your presentation, and also in Spanish. Um, also, there's a chat version for them to write questions, comments, or um, any, anything they want to share with us. Um, well, let me introduce you Massimo, which, you know, it's difficult to introduce someone that, uh, that you love, right? And someone that is your very close friend uh, without, you know, jumping into, into too many love and, and tender words. But, uh, but I'm going to try to be objective from now on. <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, Massimo is the, well, I'm, yes, I'm going to say what I, still I'm going to be a part of that first part, but it's, uh, he would argue something maybe. Uh, I feel Massimo is the most uh, important um, astronomer in the world, and that's my opinion. Uh, but it's not only my opinion. Um, when you go to media and you, you can go online and check about Massimo, uh, Massimo is a person that truly, truly made a difference in, in, you know, the astronomer industry in that world, which is very far away from business uh, from some people. But you will see in this presentation how important is the job that people like, like Massimo do for humanity, right? Actually, they look at the stars. And when you hear that, it's like, okay, that's kind of a poetic thing, right? Like kind of a dream. Uh, no, no, no. It's far more than that. It's a very scientific approach to how to see the behavior of the stars and the planets so that by observing them, you can imply or deduce some things that are happening out there in the space and that can bring us information about what happens beyond planet Earth. Um, so it's not about going there with a spacecraft. It's going there with a nice telescope, the biggest possible, the best possible, and Massimo knows a lot about this, so that we can see the space and then drive conclusions that can bring humanity to the next level. Um, Massimo uh, fell in love with astronomy when he was a kid, right? When he was, well, a teenager. Um, and there's something related to a stamp collection uh, connected to that moment in his life when he decided that the stars was was actually his his life and and you know uh, his mother gave him a book entitled Lestel the stars and I think the stars have been his world for for all these years uh, he's been working in many places in the United States uh, in Chile um, in many places Germany um, and, and for many different organizations as a scientific and also as a in a more managerial or um, let's say uh, executive role what i think it's impressive about massimo is that you know is the kind of person that is able to set up a vision uh, like a great leader and go and pursue that vision putting together all the elements that are needed for that imagine the complexity of putting together the largest telescopes in the world uh, when you need to uh, think about where the money is going to come from, and then you need to put together many different people from many different countries, um, then select the right place to set up the facility, and then build it. And not only that, once it's built, Massimo is an expert also in reading the stars and understanding what they can see from there. Uh, Massimo works worked for the last few years for the European Observatory. Um, um, European Southern Observatory, ESO, <laughs> and, uh, and he's been spending half of the time in Chile, where he has uh, most of the largest observatories he's built, and he will explain you why it's Chile, uh, and also uh, in Munich, Germany, where it's the headquarters for the ESO organization. So, Massimo, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you here, and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 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 don't, don't exaggerate uh, about uh, me. Uh, let me tell you what I decided to do today is to explain a bit of my life, starting from the beginning and then uh, following my career. 
to show the one thing that I like to convey to everybody. When you're young, even when you're not young, try to have a dream and try to do everything to have the dream become reality. So uh, if you show the first uh, image, can you change, Rafa? Yep. Uh, here you see me at the age of 18 when I, I took a private license. And then I was known in my town, Monza, former one uh, town, uh, by the fact I was an amateur astronomer. So a journalist came and asked, uh, now you have 18 or you want to have a, a, a Ferrari? They said, no, I want to have a bigger telescope. And uh, this obsession to have a bigger telescope was transformed in a dream when I went to university. And the dream was to operate as astronomer in the biggest observatory in the world. With the idea the second is just the first of the last. So it had to be the biggest, the best, not the second. That is not interesting. And that it was what I had in mind. So to achieve this dream, first of all, I had to become astronomer. And then uh, uh, through a university career in physics, uh, and then I moved to United States, to Arizona, where I learned how to use telescope, spending three years, most of the time, on mountain observing the sky, learning how to use um, telescope. You can see the next slide. Here I am in uh, Catalina Mountain in Arizona, near Tucson. I was young, full of enthusiasm of being an astronomer and hoping to, to change the knowledge of our universe. Well, I did a little bit of that in the year early 70s. We're discovering with a team, big void in universe. But uh, it was only a preparation. And then I discovered that it was time to go back to Europe because um, ESO, European South Observatory, was going to open the biggest telescope for uh, Europe, but not in Europe, in uh, South America. Next slide. In a place called Atacama Desert, the incredible desert uh, that is the driest and most hostile uh, you can imagine, but it has a property to have the best quality for astronomy. So I jumped immediately when there was opportunity to work at, in that desert, and I went to a, a big telescope that was just finished, the 3.6 meter telescope. Uh, you can see in the next uh, slide. And this was located in the south of uh, the desert of Tahama, uh, in the south of La Silla. And you will see in the story, I will tell you, what I've done after the experience in the South, when I move with my team of engineers and technicians and astronomers in the North, in the center of the Atacama Desert, and I build the two biggest observatory in the world. So achieving my dream, that was to work in the biggest and best observatory. The best way is to build it. So let's go back to the first small telescope, the 3.6 meter, the, um, La Silla telescope. Next. So, next. You can see the telescope. It's a big monster. There was, uh, uh, everybody was very proud of this uh, new achievement, European scientific technology thing. And I was lucky to be uh, the second to use this telescope because I was coming from Arizona where I had a lot of experience in using big telescope, American one. And in Europe, there was not such a big experience. And at first I found there was, this was a good telescope, but it was not what it had to be. We need to do better. And I spent a lot of time in the prime focus on the top of this uh, big uh, monster, 20 meter high. You can see in the next slide. Uh, 
where I was sitting for uh, 11 hours every night uh, observing the sky. Imagine you stay in the desert of Atacama in the cold of the winter as well at a 2,500 meter altitude in this cylinder looking a star for 11 hours with four buttons and try not to have the star moving out from the center of this cross. I found that this was good, romantic, but was not a good thing for astronomers. We had to do something more modern. And so I decided with a team of engineers to guide a group to build a totally new machine that it was replacing the human intervention on the top of the telescope in automatic mode. And this was a automatic uh, play changer, automatic focus system, automatic guidance system. You can see me, next slide, uh, going up with this triple adapter. The first night I went up with, the, with my machine because like when you have a new baby, you don't leave the baby alone in a room. You stay with the baby. But then I removed this uh, horrible chair, was a standing chair. And then uh, everything was working automatically. And uh, my criticism was received by the director of organization. He said, well, you complain about the telescope being built by uh, engineers and not by astronomers. Now we have a few telescopes to build again. So can you do it? And then I was transformed in astronomer trying to serve astronomy also in building new machine. And there I learned what it means to be managing project, uh, every time more ambitious. The first was not so ambitious in size. And you can see that the next one is a 2.2 meter telescope. This was a, a telescope that was existing, but it was in a boxes in Heidelberg to go to Namibia. And then uh, Namibia condition was not that good. So the German Max Planck Institute decided to give to us and they say, can you put in Chile at the Observatory of La And uh, the director said, okay, take these things from the wrong place, uh, put together, install, and have the thing working. And then I asked how much money I had. And they say, well, we have not much money. We have only 5 million Deutsche Mark. Ah, and then I went to Spain where there is a, a twin of a thing. And he discovered the German building in Spain, the same telescope, same size, the same, a twin. And they spent 50 million just for the building. And I had only five to go to take the thing from Germany change mechanically, erect the building, the dome, and put everything in, in order. Well, and then I start to think, how can I spend better the money than uh, the, the other have done? Well, if you don't have the money to build a big building, you build a small building, shorter, because it costs less. At the time, the people saying, well, if you are not too high, uh, the, the quality of the telescope is per, perturbed by the atmosphere. Well, I built a, a very short one. Can you see the next one? And, uh, and I built in a very <clears throat> uh, uh, economic way. It's not always the expensive thing <clears throat> are the best. But best thing is to have people doing well the thing. And I had incredible people. We are now in the early 80s from Chile. They were building this uh, new observatory. Next slide show another thing that uh, I have to do. Next. Well, the, 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 the dome was uh, the, the, the German in, in Spain. It was uh, eight millions and I have only one million. So I went to the catalog of uh, dome for amateurs 
on a very sky telescope, a very famous magazine of, of amateur astronomy. And I found a company in the state that did this aluminum dome, very cheap. Uh, of course, the German people, Max Planck Institute, say they were crazy. And um, well, <laughs> when you have limited money, you try to think the best. And then we did finally put together the telescope. Next. Now, uh, we have also done at that time another thing that um, it was considered to be not correct. We remove the astronomer from the telescope. We did decide to operate as to a remote control telescope from another place. This was, was saving a lot of money in a uh, um, logistic. So everything, it was working very well. Next. And this become the real serious thing in my life. Um, Germany, I was satisfied with the work we did because with 5 million, we put everything together and it was working very, very well. Uh, we learned that uh, it was a lot of electronics unnecessary that it was producing uh, noise in the image and not the, the height. And so when, Friend, um, Italy and Switzerland give us 25 million Deutsche Mark. The director general decided to build a totally new telescope of the same size of the big one, the 3.6. And it was called the NTT, the New Technology Telescope. And they asked me, okay, do it. So next slide, show you, next, no, you, you, you skip it. You, I think. No, backward, backward. No, you continue to go on. Can you go back? You, 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 you want to cut? I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to go back one second. Uh... Okay, any question for the time being? Any questions or comments? So, I think Massimo, this is the one you, you want to see, this one here. Yes. Okay, here, you know, the 3.6 you've seen before, it, it, it cost 1977, about uh, 70 million Deutschmark. And we are, we've been asked to do the same size of telescope for 25 million, so a third. And so we had to find the way, and we found the way. Uh, next slide. You Massimo, see. Massimo yeah. we have a question. Is why Chile? Why Chile? It's, it's oh. important. Very good. Uh, if you look in the, in the world, there is this uh, area of uh, Atacama Desert that is by far the best for astronomy for the following reason. It's elevated about 2,500 meters. And there is a wall uh, on, the, uh, on the Pacific. So the sea touch the ground and then a vertical wall, 2,000 meters. The, the water of Pacific in that area is very cold. So the clouds are from a low level and they're not entering in the uh, plateau, plateau, well, the, the desert at 2,500 meters. And the other side, to the east side, there is uh, the um, uh, Andes, 7,000 meters. So the number of clear nights that we have in this uh, desert for astronomy, it can reach 340, 330 night, clear night per year. So the unique condition 
that uh, are uh, uh, giving us the possibility to observe the sky in an uh, incredible uh, way. In addition, the wind coming from the Pacific, it does not uh, reach uh, the ground of the, where the observatory is without uh, being perturbed by thermal uh, turbulence because it coming from the sea in a laminar flow. And so there is very little turbulence at high level above the, the observatory. Well, going back to NTT, you know, we had to decide to do our thing. Okay, if you have them reduced cost, you have to re reduce the, the total weight. And one way to reduce the total weight in a telescope is to reduce the weight of the main mirror because everything else depends on the weight of the big disk of glass. And so the only way to reduce that weight is to have very thin, but then become very flexible. But then if you can compensate this flexibility with a number of actuators and a lot of computer that control in active way the shape of the mirror. And this is what uh, is illustrated here. So we, we built something that was very uh, thin, about 20 centimeters and a 3.5 meter in diameter. And it was controlled actively, looking the star and the focal plane and uh, readdressing information to all this uh, piston that was checking. And this thing was a machine that now is used also in a big photography with out of focus, everything automatic. And so this telescope of 3.5, the NTT, it became the prototype of all new telescopes in the world. After the first light of this uh, 1988, nobody was able to build a new telescope without taking this concept that we inaugurated or we demonstrated. Next. Of course, to reach this, we start with a small prototype of one meter in diameter with all these actuators. Then now you can find in the Deutsche Museum in Munich, uh, in the area of astronomy. This is a prototype of active optics. There was a, a beautiful uh, demonstration. It's one meter diameter and, and three millimeter thick mirror uh, that we, we tested for a year and before to build a big one. Next. Then we had the, the, the casting at size of the shot and then size of the mirror. And then we also build next. Uh, this telescope, it was in a very small building, uh, very short. So we, we save a lot of money in concrete, in steel. We, we had core rotating. Everything it was reduced to the minimum. And this allowed us to achieve the completion, not spending the 25 million, but the 22 millions. So we even save money. But also the way to save money, it was to operate an intelligent way to find company for uh, this construction. I went around and I, I tried to find company able to do this machine, taking my engineer the responsibility to design and take responsibility of the machine and asking people capable to build, just build what we design. So we remove from them the responsibility of the per final performance. And we took to my team of engineers and opticians. And so I was going around trying to find industry, uh, for example, in mechanical engineer uh, industry able to do big, um, machinery, nothing to do with a telescope. And I remember once when I selected the, the company for the steel structure, I went to a, a company very famous in Italy for big machine. 
And I ask, can you build this telescope? And the guy said to me, well, we are not building telescope. We never been built a telescope. We need all this kind of big machine for industry. Yeah, yeah, but uh, this telescope is, is interesting. I said, no, we are not interested. Well, it's okay, let's do the following. I give you all the drawing and I come back in two weeks. And when I came back two weeks, the guy said to me, you are destroying my company. Now everybody wants to build telescope because they found that beauty to do high technology when they were doing precision thing, but link to just do a, 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 a normal piece of mechanic. Well, next. So you can see this uh, telescope it was much smaller than the, the 3.6 size in, in mirror. And here is a TO, my engineer. This five people, because I had no responsibility and only I was counting on them. Uh, they had the responsibility to do this monster that it was working so well. And here it come a very important thing in the, the business of uh, running project. You do not know everything. You, you, you cannot know everything but you have to be able to select the right people, give to them the authority to do mistake eventually and take responsibility for a mistake and correct before they do the mistake. And this is very important, the, the team spirit that you have to create. Okay, next. We also build this kind of thing that uh, the, the people, one journalist from Nature came and said, oh, this is ugly. It's not a beautiful dome for astronomy. And I said, this one is to, to work during the night when you don't see it, but uh, it, it, it has to work well. And this was a total revolution in the construction of dome for telescope. Uh, this is something that uh, it allowed the, the, the telescope to be protected during the day, maintain thermally at the right condition in the, in the day. And when it was open the night, the telescope didn't know it was uh, protected because it was totally exposed. Next. So this was uh, the first night when we obtained incredible results. Results that never achieved by any telescope in the world on the ground. And this I demonstrated the active optics, uh, it was the way to go. Here is an engineer, the, the, the one uh, in the middle, that uh, invented the active optics. He was a genius. And the other two, they were software engineer because everything uh, is now controlled by a computer. We have hundreds of computers <laughs> in real time. <laughs> Next. Well, you can see here a demonstration of what is this telescope uh, compared to the previous one. Look, the, the picture of, uh, is a picture of the same part of the sky. Okay, obtained with a 3.6 is a top right, with respect of the entity bottom left. It was a change of factor three in quality in image and uh, something that uh, never was considered to be possible from the ground. The reason is the quality of the site and the second is the quality of the mechanic, the optics, controlled automatically by the computer. So this first light of entity, it gave a boost for next big project. Next. Uh, here is, is a picture I took of a two telescope, the 3.6 the entity. You can see the difference. Uh, uh, and if you put together, is one is about less than a third in, in height compared to the other monster. Next. And here is, I cannot resist from a picture I took 
of the entity with the Milky Way, uh, this beautiful sky of Chile. Uh, this is just a photo I took with the, my camera. This is 25 seconds exposure time. And uh, this shows the beauty of Milky Way in the direction of Sagittarius and Scorpio uh, in the center of our galaxy. Next. So that is we were with this, all this work, my life was ruined because then start the next project. Now, before to start the next project, I would like to ask questions to the people and have a mini break. I think we have some people who raised their hand. Um, let me see, because I cannot see who are those, but I think Camila raised their hand, uh, if I'm correct, Camila. I'm not well, completely sure, Rafael, right. they, uh, that, that the students can speak. They can. I think they can put questions. They can write questions, and we have a uh, uh, three. Ah, okay. Them. Okay. And and also in the chat we have some comments. Uh, okay. So I'm seeing here um, Nelson Nolasco Massimo asked a question, which is, what was the most difficult part of building these telescopes? Oh, very interesting. The most difficult part was to, to have the community, even the director general organization, believing that it was going to work, being so thin. This was coming from about uh, 60 years of building big telescope like Palomar with a thick, solid um, disc of glass cannot deform on the gravity. And uh, the director general said, well, I, I trust you, but uh, you cannot fail. So do something that uh, is uh, in a passive mode without your active uh, uh, optic, uh, working like the other one, more or less. And then the active optics, it will be improving. And that was a very challenging thing because we had to build something that was working, but even if the active optic was not constant, was not operating, it was able to do astronomy. And uh, it, we did that. And then uh, of course, in the next project you will see, we abandoned this uh, passive mode. We are only active. But this was very tough. And only uh, when uh, we achieved the first light, the people believe us. So the, the important thing is if you believe in something, don't be discouraged from the people that think that you will not achieve. Because you, it just matter to put in all the energy and all the brain of good people. Sounds fantastic. Um, there's another question, maybe the last one before you continue, which is from Alejandro Peña. Alejandro asks, what kind of recommendations can you give us when you are picking a team in which you need to know that you will be able to trust moving forward, right? Those people that you know that are the right people to help you build in the telescopes and the projects. Well, you have to analyze what you need. Second, you have to be sure that this guy is not a prima donna, uh, that he likes to work in a team. There is no, only somebody wants to play violin alone, he can play violin alone. But we build this kind of thing. You have to have many orchestra and you have to have Everybody you know, knowing what, what, which instrument he has in the hand and work together, listening to the others. So it's very, very important. But the most important thing for the manager 
when he set up this kind of thing is the probation period. Uh, you have to have the courage, sorry to say, to stop somebody that does not do what you uh, want uh, from him. So it happened to me more than once that I had to say, you, you can go, if you do not agree to doing this thing, out of this door. But this door is have an automatic lock. You will not come back from in this room. And this is not easy, in particularly when you are under pressure for a project. But if you do not do this, you're going to have more delay. You will never achieve that thing. And the other thing is very important. Uh, you can achieve a lot from people when they, they are good intellectually and technically, if they understand that they have the freedom to perform the best way. And the, the, the manager will give to them the full credit of what is achieved and remove from them all the problem if the problem had been encountered. And this is not a good thing. You will see later, I will go the conclusion on this thing. But um, this is a, and that, it's very difficult to find bad people, okay? To be, have people that are badly guided, but very bad people, people ahead of a couple that they were selling information to the potential supplier, that's, that's, but they fired it. Okay, so I, I told you this uh, two little telescope that we, we uh, did properly, but the second entity, it was um, a, a big relief for the organization that uh, is, uh, they had a dream in 1977. 1977 is when I, I, I used the 3.6 time when I arrived at the organization. And we, at that time, the chief engineer of the organization uh, proposed a new telescope. Next. It was a conference on uh, optical telescope of the future. And everybody was dreaming big telescope. The American was dreaming at 25 meter, the Russian 20. And we it was coming from Europe, just finishing the big work on the 3.6. We say, okay, we are more modest. We want to do the 16. Well, and so we, we study here in December 77, how to do a 16 meter telescope. So immediately this, uh, this thing that was invented by our chief engineer, just, just finished three point six, to uh, be participating to this conference on big telescope in the future. We, our director general say, okay, now, now you have to do it. So in 78, next slide, uh, we set up a committee in which uh, I, I was lucky to participate as astronomer at this time, I was still astronomer at that time. And we thought about the telescope future with possible three projects to build a 16 meter, uh, sorry, for the, uh, 16 telescope of four meter uh, diameter. It was easy. We had already done one, finish one, do 16. Eight meter or one or 16 meter in segment. And this will work and here you can see in March 78. Okay, uh, at the end of 78, we already decided to build four eight meter. Next. And this was a memo, this is a December, November 78. We, we decided to build a, a four, eight meter can operate individually or together. And this started the VLT project. And uh, uh, we are 78, 
So we spent about uh, eight years trying to find the money for doing this project. In the meantime, we did the, the entity. And when uh, in 86, the government of Europe gave us the money, I received the instruction to run this project again. And my work as an astronomer making telescope, it was destroyed. I became a manager, a lawyer, a architect, and I, I, I had to build the biggest observatory in optical observatory in the world. And let me give you an idea. It took uh, eight years to convince Europe to give us 800 million uh, euros to build a 16 meter in the form of four eight meter telescope. And then it took me 17 years to do the project. So here we're talking about 20, <laughs> 25 years of uh, work to do a project of this size. And this uh, needs patience. And you can imagine how many problems one encounter in, in, in running a project for 22 years. <laughs> Next. So this was a proposal in 86. We presented asking the money and then uh, we received the money. Next. And then we had to find a mountain and we decided to have the best mountain available. The mountain in the center of Atacama Desert, the worst place for to put something of high technology. Here, there is no water. There is a Pacific. You can see the Pacific is only 12 meter, there's 12 kilometer away. Uh, on the other side of the view, next, there are 190 kilometers of the desert uh, to reach the Andes and the border with Argentina. This is a place with no water, no electricity, no plant, no animal, no insect, nothing of nothing. And when uh, we selected this thing, my friend American, yeah, yeah, you can go, uh, say, okay, you will die with your telescope on this uh, desert because you cannot build a, a telescope there. It's true. We have to build a, a town. We have to build something more than a telescope. Well, first of all, we took a mountain. It was a beautiful mountain. We had to chop the top of the mountain, removing 400,000 cubic meter of rocks and removing very gently in order to avoid fragmentation of the rocks where it was going to put. So it took from 91 to 94 to cut properly the mountain. And then it was another many years to build the, the, the observatory. Next. So this is what happened when you remove 400,000 cubic meter rocks. And this become the base for the new observatory, the biggest and the best in the world. Next. You, you can imagine that to build the thing in this condition represent a severe uh, problem in terms of logistic management. I reached a moment where I had 700 people working on this uh, place. Remember, there's no water. We are taking still today water from 180 kilometers away. There was no electricity. We had to produce our electricity. Uh, there was very tough condition. Here you have humidity can go down to 3% for a, a, until week. Uh, is, is a tough place. And then you have to do this uh, four telescope uh, and then you have to motivate people to do the first, be satisfied with the first, and do the second, satisfy the second, and then do a, a third and a fourth. So it was a very interesting thing. This I'd like to show the next slide because you show this um, uh, Paranal mountain next to Acropolis 
in terms of, no, you go back, uh, in terms of size and, and place. So I always like to think that what we built was Acropolis of the modern uh, time, using the mountain, flattening, and putting all the temple on the top. And this uh, temple a little bit more sophisticated than the old one, but uh, not uh, as so so easy to do. That was not easy to build Acropolis, I imagine. Next. So the, the key thing was the mirror, of course. This was never done, the eight meter diameter mirror. It, it, we had to convince the industry to build a factory to produce this mirror. And it took just to one of the four, two years of working with the glass, liquid glass, and then cool down uh, and then transform the glass in glass ceramic. And after two years of this, it was this disc was sent to Paris. Next, where it was polished optically with accuracy of five nanometer. It was two years more, so we have now done four four years when the mirror was ready in Europe and it had to be taken to Chile. Next, me time in Milan, we were building the the first of of four telescopes. This was high engineering with the direct drive, uh, sophisticated thing, uh, uh, hydraulic system. This was uh, a monster. Next. And, and we had to solve also problem when you go to, with this kind of big pieces in, in town and <laughs> you have to find a, a innovative solution to have the this thing going through uh, the different part of the town. Next. And then we arrive in the last 80 kilometer of the desert before the summit. And of course, at the time we had no road. And so we had to have a scraper in front of the uh, of a convoy to flat the desert. And this took three days to 250 kilometer at three kilometer per hour with a couple of people did more than 60 kilometer walking along to be sure that everything was uh, well done. Next. So you can see part of a journey in the desert of Atacama, the, the place that looks like Mars. If you come up there, take a picture and, and uh, Rafa knows this because he have been there, there with me. And then with Photoshop, you change the color of the sky from blue to black. And you look at the NASA picture, you would be convinced they've never been to Mars. Okay, but there's no truth. <laughs> Next. And here finally, the mirror arrived and, and, and the, the astronomy star. Next. Here you can see the mirror, this time was 8.2 meter in diameter, only 12 centimeter thick. There was 450 actuators with accuracy uh, able to deform this of nanometers. Next. And here you see the final thing. These four big telescopes installed after 22 years from the ideas. So the dream, it was becoming true. And my dream to work in the biggest observatory and best observatory in the world, finally was achieved. It was tough, but it was achieved. Next. And here you see the beauty of this place. This you can see the, the four telescope, the Milky Way, the two Magellanic clouds, a laser cannon that we use to create artificial star at 75 kilometer altitude to then manipulate the mirror, one mirror and uh, remove all the turbulence generated by the atmosphere in the 70 kilometer above us. Next. 
yeah, you know, another picture of uh, this uh, picture of picture took with just a Nikon camera, a commercial one. Okay, and this uh, uh, about 25 second exposure time. Next. Now this is, is a, 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 a picture I took with the first telescope we operate. This is a bit longer exposure. The left is a VLT, this ground base, is 12 hour exposure. And the right is Hubble Space Telescope, 22 hour exposure. Here we have changed completely our perception about ground-based astronomy versus space telescope astronomy. In the 90, when we, we built the thing, the people thought, well, you cannot compete with space telescope because the turbulence of atmosphere and so on. We demonstrated with this uh, first thing that to, be, to send space telescope operating optical was a waste of money. Matter of fact, the next generation is infrared. And the ground-based telescope, if it positioned in unique and the best place in the world, can compete and even be better the space telescope. Next. This is a picture I like a lot because it was done in the day inauguration and it was the, the best picture, longest picture picture ever taken by ground-based astronomy. There was a, a luck the morning before the arrival of all the guests for the inauguration, 800 people, and they showed to them. We, I, I've been, in my life, I've been lucky as well. Okay. And uh, I don't know, uh, it depends on how much you, 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 you work, the luck sometimes. But uh, you have to be also a little bit of luck. And this was a big luck. Next. So we had this uh, uh, fourth telescope operational uh, from 98, 2000. Now it's 20 years. They're operating every night, producing beautiful science. And, and, and think that they've been um, uh, gaining uh, Nobel Prize. The last one uh, was last year. Uh, it was obtained for the observation of the um, black hole in our central galaxy by uh, German astronomer operating with this telescope on the on the left, and this uh, also the the discovery of the acceleration of the expansion universe was obtained through observation done with this telescope. So these are really change our way to see the universe thanks to this uh, 25 years of work of thousands and thousands of engineers, astronomers, and uh, people dedicating their life to this one. And in many times also lawyers and architects. Next. Because when you build something like that, you cannot only do the, the telescope, you have to do something around. The town. Next. Next. Here is what happened to me in the first eight year of uh, life on this mountain. I was sleeping in this container for eight years uh, because the money was uh, assigned for telescope and installation, turning installation, not for dormitory. But when in 2001, we finished the construction, we had $12 million and we decided to build a, a hotel, of course, now it's called a residence. And my idea was after being for eight years, living in a container like that, in a place with no water, no electricity, nothing or nothing. I decided to propose the director general of ESO to build a hotel with a swimming pool. It was uh, four o'clock in the afternoon. I went to his office and said, Ricardo, why we don't do a hotel with a swimming pool on Paraná? Now this guy that um, exploded and he said, well, Massimo, I know you since 10 years now, 
they work together. I, I, I suspicious that you're crazy. Now a demonstration. <laughs> and so I say, well, listen, Ricardo, I think your brain today is not working properly. Let me tell you that this guy, two years later, won a Nobel Prize for physics. So he was a genius. <laughs> it was tough. We, we fight every day for, for 10 years. But, <laughs> and and, and the, the point is, a guy came back the following day. I immediately to my office and say, Massimo, I, I talked yesterday night with my wife. And she said that I'm crazy. You are you're right. So we started to look for architect to build a hotel with a swimming pool in the most high and hostile place. The water has something, has a movement, has a color, something that uh, work on the brain. And there's a big difference when you're building the big thing. The attitude of the team building the thing is adventure. It's like to go to, to look for Indians like Colombo. Uh, you, you, you take a risk. But when you have to operate for 20, 30 years, you cannot put the people in this kind of container. So next. We, at the end, we're building this small town. On their left, you will see a dome, very small. But you don't see any other thing. That is uh, the hotel. The architects say, when you arrive to Paraná, you are coming to see the telescope, not the hotel. But when you go inside the hotel, you will be in a totally different place. Next. Here is a different design. I, we, I went around all over Europe and South America to find architect. Okay, and I received 12 projects, beautiful. The uh, top left is the one we have uh, selected. Next. Here you can see the construction. So when you are asked to build observatory, you have to learn also how to build hotel and how to build hotel in a place that has the highest probability to have a quake above Richter scale nine. This is the most dangerous place in the world for earthquake. So everything can be done to resist a big earthquake. Next. Here you see the, the thing is uh, taking form, and now you see the final way. And here is what is uh, the Paraná Hotel that being used by James Bond in one of the movies. And here is a swimming pool that is not only beautiful, you can also swim, but uh, also is very useful because the evaporation of the water increase naturally the humidity inside against the low humidity outside. Next. Well, we also have done something more. We have changed completely the way the telescope were used by the astronomer. When I was young and I was working in Arizona, I was allocated telescope time. I had my night. I was able to do what I want. And in a way I was. Please, we decided you don't spend one billion dollars and then you can do whatever you want. Do something good for you and the community. So we created a totally new way to, to give telescope time. We have not given any telescope time. We give scientific valid data. So we were uh, asking proposal. We were, we are doing the observation for them. We deliver data, and the data after a year are available to the rest of the community for free to do more research. So there was also a big change in culture that we have produced. Next. Well, I stop again because. Now I was satisfied, I had a dream 
to go to Antarctica and, and visit this uh, continent. Unfortunately, the story is not so simple. Uh, and uh, let's have some questions. Thank you, Massimo. Well, um, we got to the one hour time we have, so we can expand a bit more for those that are interested to continue here. I think uh, it's very interesting the remaining part for Massimo. And I think also it's a good moment for you to, if you have a, one question, um, uh, I see here questions from um, uh, Diana, for example. Um, yeah, and for example, there's one here from Diana is, is connected to the qualities of the people in your team. And, and Juan and I ask a question, I think it's crucial about what these telescopes serve for. And Juan Massimo asks, what was the most important goal that you can find in this project? Or uh, also, um, uh, this is connected also, Massimo, with things like the one that I could witness when I, when I was with, with you there. Um, you know, like when you think about astronomers, you think about the, the picture Massimo showed, like he's sitting on his amateur, you know, inside the telescope, looking at the stars, like almost like this. Well, you, I could witness that the astronomers working all night in front of computers. Um, and for example, I saw a project where, you know, they were looking at two objects in the sky, planets, stars, and then just like observing it, you know, for many days in order to see if, for example, there could be like a greenish uh, kind of um, shadow uh, somewhere so that if there's something greenish, maybe there's profile, if there's profile, maybe there's life in one of those. So this is the kind of things that uh, these gentlemen and these people can do uh, with observatories, right? And that is why also it's so important that they are bigger and bigger and, and they are better and better because like this, you can see the sky better and get more information about it. Yeah, so, I think there are two aspects that are very important. First of all, the advancement in the understanding of our universe. And understanding of our universe means understand ourselves from where you're coming, where, where we are, where we're going. Um, and this telescope, particularly in the last 50 years, has been a revolutionary. Uh, let me just give you one number. If I remember a time when I was in university, and it was not the time of dinosaurs, okay? It was uh, <laughs> in the late 60s. We thought to understand everything about the formation, the composition of the universe with uh, elementary particle. Okay. Now we know today, after 50 years, that what we know to be the composition of the universe, proton, electron, neutrino, other, is just 4% of what the universe is made of. There are 25% is this dark matter that we have no idea what it is and dominating the gravity of the universe. And 75% um, is the dark energy that produce acceleration universe. So control the evolution universe into expansion, accelerating that we have no idea what it is. So there's been a tremendous revolution in our understanding. And that you understand in a moment why we are going to spend even more money to understand this thing. But let me also say one thing is important because in my experience, uh, I've been not only observing the sky, but also the ground in the industry around telescope. Uh, a lot of people have been uh, making a piece of a telescope or installation for us. And sometimes I told them, why you charge us for what we ask you to do? You have advantage so big in publicity, but also in technology gain, that you will have to pay us for um, uh, what uh, uh, we ask you to do. Instead, we pay you. Matter of fact, everybody has been losing money because uh, so new thing that they are not able to establish the cost before to start the project. But um, uh, there is a lot of, of 
or return, not return in all these projects because we are, we are pushing the thing at the limit. Very interesting. Thank you, Massimo. So I, I'm going to continue sharing the screen. Okay. So uh, as I say, my dream was to go to Antarctica, but unfortunately, the American, the Japanese, and European decide to join all the money and build ALMA, uh, Atacama Large Millimeter Array. So they asked me, well, your experience to build things in a hostile place. OK, why you don't go to Chanantur? Uh, you go through a, a desert. Then you go on a mountain, you reach a plateau of 5,000 meters, and you build the biggest radio telescope in the world. And though I accepted, unfortunately, unfortunately so I had to, uh, to postpone my, my trip to Antarctica. And this is uh, in 2002 when I became director, and I started to go up and down mountain uh, between 2,500 and 5,000 meters without road. Next. Uh, and encounter uh, sand and then uh, snow at 4,800 meters. Now, when you're stuck at 4,800 meters by snow, uh, it's not easy to, to go out when you have no oxygen uh, to breathe. So it was tough. Next. But now we have this thing after um, 18 years. And we have a camp at 3,000 meters, and then the telescope at 5,000 meters. This is a total different thing. Next. This is what the, is the situation at 5,000 meters. It's a big plateau of 14 by 14 kilometers, uh, where we have 66 antennas. And uh, as I say, we have a half of the oxygen that there is a sea level. And to build all this high technology antenna at 5,000 meters is a big challenging thing, uh, not only technologically, but also physically. Next. In addition, this was, uh, is constructed and operated by a consortium of uh, American Institute, uh, Japanese Institute, and European Institute. So it's the first global astronomic um, activity. And I can tell you to run all such a different culture, technology, in industry, is an extremely interesting thing. With this machinery, we can uh, monitor, for example, the presence of water and the distribution of water all over the universe. We can see molecules very complicated. We have seen in the, in the universe molecules that are the base of DNA. So we can see the formation of uh, planet with the formation of this round star in which you start to form molecules that can be at the origin of life. Next. And here is operated at, as I say, 5,000 meters, but nobody's there during the night and we operate remotely from 3,000 meters. Next. Okay, I cannot go too long because I have no time. And so I was thinking to do Antarctica, you know, that, that gave me a, a new job. And a new job was to participate to a new big telescope, ELT. I was too old to become, uh, and I refused, to become a project manager of this project. This, this big telescope need to be done by young engineers. So we have found one. But as an old man with experience, I took a different area. Next. So here is what you're going to build, a 40 meter diameter uh, telescope. We are under construction. Uh, we have received, this is only European, 
five billions uh, euro to build this big machine. Next. And here you can see that this uh, telescope compared to the Paranal, to the Barcelona uh, Cathedral or the pyramids. Then we go back to the history, big thing. Uh, and we are now uh, in the erection phase uh, of the foundation. Next. And just to give you an idea, to the left, you see a picture of one second of arc of the sky done by space telescope. To the, the right, you see what we will do with 25 meter for the same part of the sky. We are going to be able with this telescope to see the first star that it was born 13 billion years ago. We'll be able to see planets around other star and observe the atmosphere and probably in 10, 15 years from now, see tra trace of life in the universe. Next. Oh, you say that and it seems like easy, but it's, it's yeah. about the creation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next we have to find a place. And we studied for 10 years where it was the best place in the world. And we found 20 kilometers from Parana. We knew in the 80 that it was, Sierra Amazonas was better than Parana. But for reason of wind, this is a long story. We were not going there. It's barely below, we could add 60,000 meters. And this mountain was selected to be the best all over the world for the biggest telescope in the world. Next one. Well, next became my activity. Um, I was asked, the organization, as an ambassador of the uh, organization in Chile, or representative, to negotiate with the government of Chile the transfer of property of this 60,000 hectares, including the biggest telescope, biggest amount, the best mountain in the world for astronomy. It was a tough negotiation. It took me three years to convince the government of Chile to give us for free. Uh, and that was a, a, a nice uh, work, a little bit different than build telescope. Okay, but it was uh, interesting. And this show one thing that uh, you have to learn how to do things uh, in general in an efficient way. Then you can do everything. You can build a telescope, you can build a, uh, a hotel, you can build a, or, or negotiate uh, acquisition of the most valuable piece of land for free uh, for astronomy. Well, next. Let me conclude with two cartoons. I hope this, uh, you enjoy the, this cartoon. First is what is a life of astronomy and the builder of telescope? Well, is to preserve the photon coming from the sky, to remove the turbulence of atmosphere, to remove the, the heat produced by the big building, to uh, not destroy having a mirror too hot, to have a surface flat and to ha have everything sending the photon in the right place in the detectors. This is, is a very hard life of a photon that can be helped by engineer, technician and, and industry doing things properly in building telescopes. And let me conclude with another story that I like to, especially for, for your type of people. Next. Uh, there is, when you are engaged in major projects, and I had the luck to, I don't know why, but also because I, my dream was to become a, a, a person working the biggest observatory in the world. When, when you are, uh, in, engage in major projects, you have only one possibility to start. 
If you, if you don't do that, you cannot do it. And you have to be enthusiastic to yourself. You have to be interested and believe. So, uh, and then you start and you go to different phase. There is a moment in which enthusiasm uh, is difficult to keep it. Well, but it, 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 you survive it's still going enthusiasm. Next. Uh, there are moments of panic. For example, uh, the two of the first two mirror of eight meter, that after three months, they were both broken and there was no possibility to build a, th a third one. This, when you, you had already invested all the money in cutting the mountain, building the, the telescope and not mirror. Well, some panic is, but you have to keep the enthusiasm. <laughs> Next. Uh, then there is always oh, a search for the guilty person, okay? And of course, you as a manager, you are uh, the first on the list, okay? And you have to keep your enthusiasm, okay? So you cannot finish the project. Next. And boy, there is always the same. The punishment of innocent. And next. Step is the decoration of all those who took no part. <laughs> well, if you go through a big project, and uh, as happened to me, and then you accept another big, and then another one, you must accept all the same and forget about all the others and keep the enthusiasm. Thank you. Thank you, Massimo. Truly, truly impressive. Um, and these stages of a major project, I think it's 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 very enlightening as well because I, I see this reflected in many in many things that I've done in my life as well, and I'm sure our students as well can see themselves reflected there. So, well, I don't know if there's any question. I know that we we've been uh, beyond the time we had planned. I think it, it was worth it to have us, you know, to have Massimo with us for a longer time. Um, I don't know if there's another question. Um, I'm checking the chat and I see known. Uh, and I'm checking also the Q&A uh, part. Um, Massimo, truly amazing. Um, you know, for us that, for those that never were in touch with the stars or with the sky, um, always listening to what you did uh, is when you understand how humanity need to have people like you that are at the forefront, right? That are like discovering the new frontier, right? And basically you are helping humanity by um, helping us understanding what happens beyond planet Earth, right? And maybe, I don't know, in my lifetime, but maybe my son will be able to to explore deeper this, the, the sky. And, uh, and you were pioneers. You were, um, you were the ones who started uh, helping us understanding what happens out there, right? And that's always, uh, I, that always impressed me. And I think it's, it's, it's really valuable also to pursue that dream uh, beyond all the obstacles that you could find in the way, right? Like deciding things that no one ever did before. And, I think that's quite inspiring. I see people here saying the same thing. Uh, thank you for the presentation, says Jose Castillo. Julian Arbelaez says, thank you, Massimo, very inspiring. Uh, Natalia says, thanks for sharing with us this incredible experience and your work. Um, so I see Nelson saying, punishment, punishment of the innocent. And he says, that rings a bell. <laughs> so yeah. Everything you shared is resonating in, in, the, in the participants, and that's wonderful. OK, awesome. thank you very much. If somebody sent a question to you, you can send to me, and then we will uh, also answer this question. Fantastic. I will, Ignacio, we offer that uh, to the students that if they need to uh, ask any question or, or know something else from, from Massimo, um, we can we can help with that, of course. Massimo, thank you very much. It's Welcome. Warmer. Thank How you for the invitation. It was fun. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. you very much.
And uh, I don't know, Ignacio, you want to say any final words before we say see you to the students? Well, just just thank. Uh, I I would like to thank again Massimo for this very very inspiring uh, uh, presentation. And um, uh, you, as, as Rafa said, you gave us the opportunity to 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 have a look at the world that we are never going to be able to be in, and uh, and that was very very inspiring. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Massimo. And now, you, um, I don't know if you have any final words, Massimo. No, I think I thank you. It's always a pleasure to share what one has done with other people, if this can help them. Thank you, and it will be very helpful. It's very helpful. Thank you, thank you very much, Massimo. <laughs> Ciao. Thank Ciao. you very much. And for all of you, you estudiantes, muchas gracias y seguimos en contacto con todo. Un abrazo muy fuerte. Muchas gracias a todos. Hasta la próxima. Hasta la próxima. Hasta luego. Muchas gracias, hasta luego.